We are thinking tonight about another of the great decisions of the Bible. This time, Lot decision. Last night we thought about Abraham. Tomorrow night we will think about Moses, the Lord willing. You remember it says in Hebrews 11, 25, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. Now we'll take a few verses out of the Old and also out of the New Testament. Of course, you know you go way back to Genesis for a start here in the 13th chapter, verse 10. And Lot lifted up his eyes and beheld all the plain of Jordan, that it was well watered everywhere before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. Even as the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt, as thou comest unto Zohar, then Lot chose him all the plain of Jordan. Then Lot chose him. <laughs> the old King James way of saying it, and I kind of like that. He's making his own choice, and he was making it for him. And then you go way over to Matthew, in the 17th chapter, and our Lord says, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be also in the days of the Son of Man. Verse 26, this is. They did eat, they drank, they married wives, they were given in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark, and the flood came and destroyed them all. Likewise, also as it was in the days of Lot, they did eat, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they built it, but... The same day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Even thus shall it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. You will observe here that he did not say as in the days of Solomon, but as in the days of Sodom. Not in days of peace and progress and prosperity. The days of Noah and the days of Sodom were two of the most corrupt periods in all human history. Sodom is a synonym for the lowest and the filthiest and the vilest in human degradation. Sodom was a moral cancer and God operated on it by fire. He cauterized it. You'll be surprised at how often you run into the word in the Bible. Sodom shows up in Deuteronomy, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Amos, Zephaniah, Lamentations, Matthew, Second Peter, Jude, Revelation, Isaiah 110, for instance. Hear the word of the Lord, ye rulers of Sodom. And really he wasn't speaking to Sodom at all. Speaking to Israel, but he used the two worst places he could think of to describe his own people. Give ear unto the law of our God, ye people of Gomorrah. Now, the text tells us here that they were engaged in perfectly normal pursuits, but something happened. They were occupied wholly with the temporal and had no regard for the future. Genesis 13, 13 says the men of Sodom were wicked and sinners before the Lord exceedingly. Judgment was approaching and the wickedness was running wild and people were living as though there were no God. As it was, so shall it be. And this is a perfect description of today. And if you notice, our Lord did not say, as it was in the days of Noah, they were getting drunk and gambling and committing adultery. Isn't it strange that he just said they were eating and drinking, and marrying and giving in marriage, and buying and selling, and planting and building? What's wrong with that? Well, there's a lot wrong with it if it's all that you do. And if you do it to the neglect of God, that is worldliness. Preachers sometimes get in a kind of a rut preaching on worldliness. I mean the few who do anymore. They don't now much. But there are a few survivors. We have a new word for worldliness now. We call it secularism. Nobody knows what that is, and it lets the preacher off the hook. But for those who still preach about worldliness, it's rather interesting to notice here that this is worldliness in the days of Noah and Rod. Not just card playing, dancing, smoking, and three or four other things. Used to say movies, but all the fundamentalists are going to them. 
now. And as it was, so shall it be. And so it is. When they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction. You know, it's always the other way round about with the Christian, what it is in the world. Good news is bad news, and bad news is good news. When they say peace and safety, that's good news, but sudden destruction cometh, that's bad news. But when you see men's hearts failing them for fear, wars and rumors of wars and all that sort of thing, that's bad news. Lift up your heads. Good news, your redemption grows now. Just the other way around the barrel. People never have talked more about peace and security, never had less of it than tonight. We call sin sickness and wickedness weakness, and we forget or refuse to face it that one day every man shall give account of himself to God. I understand that when Billy Graham was writing one of his books about the awful conditions, the moral low in this land, that Ruth, his wife, looked over his shoulder and said, if God doesn't judge America, you'll have to apologize to Sodom and Gomorrah. I think that's well put. Well, just what was the trouble with Sodom and Gomorrah? We are told of all places in Ezekiel 1649. Behold, this was the iniquity of thy sister Sodom, three things, pride, fullness of bread, and abundance of idleness. Pride. First, you remember that in Genesis 11, 4, the people said, Let us build us a city and a tower, whose top may reach into heaven. Let us make us a name. There are three let uses. In early Genesis, and all of the history of this world is wrapped up in three let uses. Let us make man in our own image. And here man says, let us build a tower to heaven. And God said, let us go down and confuse them. And that's history. Let us go down and confound their language. That's history in a nutshell. We're boasting today like Nebuchadnezzar when he said, Is not this great Babylon that I have built for the house of the kingdom by the might of my power and for the honor of my majesty? We've never been so proud of ourselves with the least reason to be than we are now. We've made man the center of the universe. There used to be a time when you could stand on a starry night and look up and say with the psalmist, When I consider the heavens, the work of thy fingers, the moon and the stars which thou hast ordained, what is man that thou art mindful of him, the son of man that thou visitest him? But now in this day of space travel, we say, when I consider man, what are the moon and the stars? The other way round about. Theodore Roosevelt lived at Sagamore Hill. I was up there some time ago to visit that home, which has become a sort of a national shrine now. Uh, Theodore Roosevelt's one of my favorite American president. And a visitor came to see him, and Teddy Roosevelt took him out on the spacious lawn at Sagamore Hill, and they looked at the stars a lot. And then the great American said to his friend, Well, I think we're down to our right size now. Let's go back in the house. Helps to take a look in that general direction. But while we try to mount up to the stars scientifically, we mire in the slime morally. Our minds are in space and our souls are in Sodom. And while we've conquered the atom, we've not mastered Adam. And we still live in a world under the dominion of Satan. It was pride that threw him out of heaven to start with. The second trouble was fullness of bread. They had too much. The valley of Jordan was unusually fertile, and of course Lot's size fell on it first thing. A superabundance of material wealth. As in the days of Lot, so in America, our technological know-how has produced a surplus of food and commodities. When I was growing up, all a farmer needed was a plow and a mule to operate a little farm. That day is gone. I heard of an old farmer back in those days who was just barely eking out an existence and driving a rattle trap old car. And he started down the road and the thing went dead right smack in front of a mental institution, insane asylum they used to call it. 
One of the inmates is standing out there, well fed, well clothed, well housed with this institution back of him. Here was this poor, horny handed son of the soil in this dire predicament. And the inmate said, Where do you live? And the farmer said, Down the road. And the inmate said, What do you do? I'm a farmer. And the inmate looked back at this nice institution down at that car and he said, You ever been crazy? No. Well, it beats, he said, it beats farming. <laughs> I know what he meant. You didn't grow up in Catawba County and try to knock our living out of those rocks down there without learning that. Now you're going to have a college degree. You're going to be an expert. While the government pays you not to farm. They didn't pay my daddy to farm. Uncle Sam spends millions and millions storing millions of bushels of potatoes and wheat and corn and butter and dried eggs that nobody wants to eat anyhow. And we study how to step up production, then we spend millions to slow it down. Millions to irrigate and build dams, and then we let thousands of acres lie idle, pay the owners for not raising anything, while we spend millions elsewhere on uh, reclaiming and on scientific farming. Now, I know they can explain all this in Washington. They can explain anything in Washington. But sometimes I wonder who's crazy. I've got an evangelist friend that in the summertime was holding a meeting and he's always scared he'd catch corn, although it was blistering hot, he put on an overcoat after the service. And one, one night he put on this heavy overcoat and a straw hat and got an ice cream cone and took off to the hotel. And he started to get on the elevator and there was a drunk standing there. And the drunk looked at the straw hat and looked at the overcoat and looked at this ice cream cone and tapped him and said, Hey, buddy, are you drunk or am I? <laughs> Sometimes I wonder who's crazy today. Then there was the abundance of idleness, and that naturally follows fullness of bread because they had time left on their hands. This is the most well-fed generation. They said there are 40 million overweight Americans. I guess you'd call that round figures, wouldn't you? <laughs> Somebody said the problem today is not the survival of the fittest, but the survival of the fattest. And I think that's just about it. Well, overproduction brings idleness. And the average man doesn't know what to do with time on his hands. That's very evident from the way they spend it. Now we've got automation and a national headache along with it. More leisure. Our heads and our hands are ahead of our hearts. And we don't know what to do with the soul of man. The experts don't know. And they do come out with some of the craziest things. The other day they got out a booklet on how to do nothing in a constructive manner. We don't even do something in a constructive manner. Somebody said we've never had more to live on and less to live for than today. And that's so true. God made an arrangement to keep us from the evils and temptations of idleness. Work is a blessing as things stand now. An abundance of idleness occurs to cause a more crime and violence than any other factor. I suppose Sweden is one of the most affluent nations today. More alcoholics, more suicides than Ireland, which is a poor country, really. Juvenile delinquency. But when they work, they don't have enough time to get in trouble. Old Dr. Mordecai Ham used to say that he wanted a bicycle one time, and he said to his daddy he wanted one. His daddy said, what for? He said, I need the exercise. He said, I hope never said that. 
He said, when I came home next day, there were two holes leaning up against the barn lawn. And he said, there's your exercise. Now, Sodom was the city of idleness, and as it was, there's one day for rest, and when used for any other purpose, you have trouble. Steady France, if you want to find out. The holy day has become a holiday. So when you break that, you break a commandment just as surely as the one about theft or about murder. Bishop Moore said it used to be the Lord's Day, and now it's the weekend. Now with these lengthened holidays, we have a problem in the church, as you know. My own denomination in Kansas City a few years ago passed a new set of statements of principle, and they said, that I don't think most of my crowd even know it's in the book there, the Lord's Day should be employed in exercise of worship and spiritual devotion, both public and private, and by refraining from worldly amusement and resting from secular employment, with two exceptions, works of necessity and works of mercy. I have not been able to fit in Sunday football as a work of necessity. And everybody knows it's not a work of mercy. Uh, yet we say that's where we stand. Then Sodom, of course, had the vilest form of immorality because sodomy is a synonym for homosexuality. We have more sodomites now than in all history. When I was up in Calvary Church, New York, in some meetings, Captain Jensen, retired deputy inspector of the New York City Police Department, a real Christian with a tremendous testimony, took Ms. Havner and me one night to church, and we drove through Central Park, and he told us about some of the characters. That was his beat for a while. I wouldn't have believed it if it hadn't been Captain Jensen telling us about what queer, weird... Uh, wrecks of humanity infest that area. You wouldn't believe that humanity could sink that low. But it breaks out in the upper crust today. And today the sodomites demand that they be accepted as normal. It's part of the new morality that makes illegitimacy respectable and subsidizes it by the welfare state. I'm not surprised that Sodom was destroyed by fire and brimstone from heaven. It was a peculiar fire. It may be that God released a little bit of uh, nuclear destruction that horrifies us now in the Adam age, because Peter does tell us that the heavens and the earth are stored up for fire against that day when the heavens shall pass away and the elements melt with fervent heat, the earth and the works thereof burned up. How up today? All that sounds today, and how fitting that our Lord should say, as in the days of Lot. He just said it in the days of Noah, when the earth was destroyed by water, now it's the days of Lot, when Sodom was destroyed by fire. And this fire has double meaning in these days when men fear atomic destruction any day, and earth awaits the final destruction in the fires of judgment. The best way to prepare for both is Matthew 10, 29, Fear not them that kill the body and are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Now, as it was in the days of Lot, when fire from heaven wiped out Sodom, so shall it be and so it is. Well, what are we going to do in Sodom? Here we are in this lovely spot tonight. It's hard to imagine that this world is as wicked as it is tonight when you're up at Ben Lippin, unless you take a look in your own heart and discover that the old Adam is as bad as ever has been. It's only the new nature, and the Christ Jesus within you, that can be uh, counted on. Lot is a classic example of what not to do. Abraham walked by faith, Lot walked by sight. His good grandfather Terah and his uncle Abraham set him a good example. But his eyes beheld these fertile plains of Jordan, and he saw a chance to get rich, and he did not take the moral and spiritual dangers into consideration, pitched his tent first toward Sodom. When I see a church member start pitching his tent toward Sodom, just give him a little more time. You'll be right in the middle of Sodom. That's why I believe in crying out against sin in its incipiency. Nip it in the bud. There are some things today that are not terribly bad in themselves. But you young people, please listen to me. 
You must judge a thing not always by what it is, but by which way it's going, and what is the trend of it, and where will I go if I go with it. The trend of it, not by its immediate uh, status. Never. Young people come up again and again and say, well, what's wrong with this? What's wrong with that? Can I dance? What's wrong with rock? What's wrong with all these things? And the trouble is, they've already got off on the wrong foot because instead of saying, how much like Jesus can I be and how little like the world, they're asking, how much like the world can I be and still be a Christian? Well, that's no way to ask it. And when you get down to business, you'll ask, how much like my Lord can I be? And when you love him like you ought to, I... You won't ask some of these questions. But how near the precipice can I walk without going over? Why don't we ask how little like the world can I be? But not just that. No, no. Because you can go around like a Pharisee with his phylacteries and all his pride and thanking God he's not like other men. The worst enemy Jesus ever had on earth went to church, prayed in public, all of them tithers, lived clean, moral lives, separated from the world, and yet they were the worst enemies of my Lord and spearheaded the movement that put him on the cross. And he said, except you repent, he said the publicans and harlots will get to heaven before you, and he said it to religious people. Except your righteousness exceed that of the scribes and Pharisees. They were separated. They wouldn't even eat an egg that had been laid on the Sabbath. But they were not right with God. And so I'm not begging you to go around bragging, I don't dance, I don't smoke, I don't play cards, neither does a gate post. <laughs> the important thing is, what are you doing to the glory of God? Certainly these things don't belong in the Christian life. But don't Pride yourself on how little like the world I am, how well you can imitate Jesus. No, not that. But how much Christ fills your life. Because there's only been one Christian life, and that's in Christ himself and the life he lived. There's only been one. But it's reproduced again and again as he lives in our hearts and in our lives. And that's, that's it. That's the life. I never would have known that Lot was a righteous man if it hadn't been for the New Testament, because it says over there that he was vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked, for that righteous man dwelling among them, and seeing and hearing, vexed his righteous soul with their unlawful deeds. But he had no business settling in Sodom to begin with. Now, geographically, we all have to live in Sodom. You can't run from it, and the Lord doesn't want us to run from it, because 1 Corinthians 5, 9, 10 says, Not company with fornicators, yet not altogether with the fornicators of this world, or with the coaches, or extortioners, or idolaters, for then must you need to go out of the world. We can be in it, but not of it. And John 17 sets you forever straight on how to line up with regard to the world. Jesus said we've been saved out of it. We're still in it, but we're not of it. But we've been saved out of it to go right back into it to win others out of it and that's the only business we have in it. And that's the setup of the Christian. And there's no excuse for settling in Sodom and accepting its way of life as it was, so shall it be. We live in a world order which is rotten. If you think that you're not in Sodom, check the theaters in any town. The book racks, the magazine racks, the other day Lucille Ball said, it shocks me that I'm not shocked. Well, now, she can say that. And Gloria Swanson, who was a famous movie actress back in the old days of the silent film, said, and she's in her 70s now, the violence, the cruelty, the despair of American movies in recent years makes me mentally and emotionally sick. Now, they know that road. And if they can feel that way, what am I to think about people who take up for all this business and claim to be Christians and true to the Word of God? Take a tip from Lucille Ball. <laughs> Gloria Swanson, I don't often say that from the pulpit. <laughs> but just once, just once try it. This time it works. 
politically and socially and educationally and economically we're under the power of Satan, the God of this age. Civilization's doomed. I've said civilization going to the dogs. I've got too much respect for dogs. <laughs> I wouldn't want to insult the canine kingdom with any such a reference as that. We're not here to save civilization. We're not here to save the ship. We're here to save the passengers. The world is not going to be Christianized, but it ought to be evangelized. God is calling out of this world people for his name. And if you look at Genesis 13, it tells you that God chose him. That was his choice. Everybody in here lives by making choices. Every day of your life, you make decisions from dawn to dark. Some of them are insignificant, maybe, and some of them are profound. But you're always making decisions. Why, it'd be interesting to check someday just how many decisions you make in one day. Some of them are rather small, but decisions, decisions. And some of them are tremendously important. If you make your foolish choice like love, choose yourself. He chose him. Plain as George. Are you going to let God choose for you? There are some uh, profound decisions that we have to make from time to time. And there's a difference between just bullheadedly and stubbornly making up your mind to do it and to say, Lord, what do you think about it? And if you will make your will known to me, I'll make it ditto and sign the bottom of the contract. What does God want? Do I speak to somebody here tonight that if you're perfectly honest with yourself, you know good and well that you've made a decision that Jesus never has okay. And you may be trying to live a Christian life and that thing keeps bugging you because you have chosen for yourself what God never chose for you. The man who walks with God can afford to let the men of this world make their choice. Oh, I like that same passage there in Genesis. It says that after Lot made his choice, the Lord turned around to old Abraham and said, Now he's made his, you and I will have a little talk. Lift up your eyes and look from the place where you are northward and southward and eastward and westward. For all the land which thou seest to thee will I give it to thy seed forever. We can afford to let this old world make its choices. If you let God make yours. The meek shall inherit the earth. Somebody said that's the only way they'd ever get it. Well, we're going to get it. Sometimes I go out for a walk in some of these fashionable areas and I see a very pretty lawn I'd like to walk on and I start that way and run into a big sign, keep out, keep out. And I say, that's all right, you can have it a while. Of course, he doesn't know that, living up there in all that pile of bricks or whatever, he doesn't know it. I feel like going in sometimes and saying, friend, you've just got a temporary lease on this place. You maybe don't know it. But the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, and the meek are going to have it. And as it was in the days of love, and Noah, so shall it be. Even so come, Lord Jesus. Let us stay. Father, if there's somebody who has slipped in here tonight who does not belong to Jesus, may the Holy Spirit speak to them tonight and right now and say that if thou wilt cast thy lot with the Lord and make him the master of thy life, what's his is thine. And that's just about everything. Help us here who claim to be thine own to remember how rich we are. Now, Lord, thou hast never told thy church to get rich, but thou hast told thy church to be rich. We are, if we only knew it, because he became poor for our sakes, that we through his poverty might be rich. We thank God for the wealth we have in Christ Jesus tonight. But help us to share it, because we're surrounded with poor paupers who may live in mansions, but who have not laid up treasure in heaven. And moth and rust corrupt and thieves break through and steal. And help us to say to them, you better get on the winning side. 
and make your deposit like Paul who said, I know whom I have trusted, and I'm persuaded that he's able to keep the deposit, which is what he really said, against that debt. Help us to make sure, Lord, of where our treasures are, and may our choices be thy choices, and when we let thee choose for us, we shall not choose amiss. We pray with thanksgiving in Christ's name. Amen. Amen.